Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing my conversations with uh, Brother Jason Jack. And we did part one of this series uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I expect this will have many parts to it. <laughs> We're attempting to go through uh, 101 verses that prove the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. So I expect it's going to take a long time to get through them all since it took us more than an hour to get through just the very first verse. <laughs> but it did have two verses in it, so... Yeah, that's true. But I, I think on the list, that was referenced as just the, the first verse, so... That is, that's the first of 101. Yeah. Yeah. We got a long ways to go, and I'm I'm sure that we're going to enjoy it, and that's, we'll be patient. I hope the viewers will be patient with us as we go through these. Some of them we might be able to get through quite quickly, and some of them might end up being quite redundant. But uh, I think this is a very uh, worthy cause we're taking on here. Uh, anything you want to say before we go uh, right into the next verse? No, let's just go on. Okay. Get number two we started. Okay. Uh, number two on the list is Romans, uh, four, verses six and seven. Um, uh, it's got the, uh, it's got the, oops, it's got just the, uh, kind of a little summary comment on the verse. It doesn't have the verse listed here. So let me go to my Bible gateway and I'll plug that in and get the entire verse. Uh, all right here we have it let me read it first and then I'll get, I'd like your thoughts on it uh, Romans chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 KJV even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works saying blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered all right, brother, why don't you begin t teaching on that? All right, well, you know, that's right in the middle of one of these whole wing verses that we use in, in my Bible. I have sort of a soul winning um, pattern that I go by where, you know, for instance, the number one that we just covered in the last video, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I have... Um, highlighted and then right underneath it I have Romans 4 and you know the first few verses of Romans 4 as the next go to uh, to discuss um, how it's faith towards God and Jesus Christ our Savior and not works of righteousness which we do for being justified and obtaining eternal life and so you know this, this falls right in line with um, with how I do it when I talk to others. Um, so, verses 6 and 7, even as David also described it, described it the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without work. Uh, so again, you know, there's that, there's that word work, and as we saw in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's not a work. In Romans 4, 6, it is without work that we are imputed the righteousness of God. And so it's just further clarification, and I'm sure we'll continue to see this as we go through this study. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think this is a good point for us to uh, kind of veer off uh, into a, a, like a, another theme that is essential for people to understand. And I've been really, really pleased as I watch your videos to see that we are in agreement on uh, dispensationalism and, and uh, salvation throughout history, uh, always being uh, the same, uh, that the only thing ever required for salvation was faith in God to save us. But the difference is that gradually throughout history, uh, God has revealed more information to us uh, about, he, about how he will accomplish it. And now we, we have all the information that uh, he would become a man, Jesus Christ, and he had to become a man in order to die. God can't die, so he had to become a man to die because the wages of sin is death. 
uh, someone had to die. God decided he would become man and die in our place, suffer and die for our sins, uh, and um, putting our faith in Jesus and his death for our sins is uh, now the complete revelation of how the means by which God would accomplish this. Uh, but the, the, the method of being saved from uh, Adam and Eve uh, throughout all of history has always been uh, by faith in God to be our Savior. Uh, and and uh, the dispensationalists who teach that uh, throughout history, there have been different dispensations where God's method of salvation was different. Uh, the, the other things were required besides faith. Uh, and uh, I was real happy to see that you, you see this as I do, because I think this is a big, big misunderstanding that a lot of people have, thinking that man got saved in the past through a combination of faith and works. And some people teach that um, there's going to come a point in time where faith and works comes back into play. Even though, even though they, they concede, well, right now it's only faith. But it, before the, the cross, it was faith and works. And, and, and at a point in time, uh, let's say that after the, after the rapture in a tribulation or a millennial period of time, it will re resort back to a combination of faith and works again. This is, uh, pretty common in the dispensational, uh, viewpoint. So here, the reason I'm going into all this is because, and you might say, you might probably think to yourself, oh, Brother Luke, here you go again. You're going to turn this one verse into an hour. <laughs> but it's, see, it's telling us even just David. Now, David was um, a thousand years before Jesus. And so it's telling us even in David's time, David described uh, that man was blessed uh, be, uh, be, by God imputing righteousness to him without works. Uh, so, I, you know, I've talked enough about this idea that, no, this dispensationalism thinking that God provided different methods of salvation throughout history is false, and we need to understand that it's always been by faith alone. And works don't save you now. Works don't work. And works never have worked. Never, you could never use work successfully to attain salvation. Okay, I talked enough. Give me your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I completely, um, I completely agree. I make it a point in a lot of my videos where I'm describing that it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And I've had so many people, you know, just be confused in this dispensational teaching about, well, what about before the cross? What about before Jesus' birth and his death and then his resurrection? And I try to show them so that they can see the big picture that salvation has always been the same and it's always been in faith towards God and believing and trusting in his promise that he will redeem us from our sins, from the iniquity of our sins, um, and bring us eternal life that can be accepted through faith and faith alone. Mm -hmm. Once they get that, that it's always been by faith, then I think the, the message of the cross makes a lot more sense to people that live on this side of it, to know yeah. that it's always been that way. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a verse in the Bible that has the, the term uh, rightly divide. Uh, and people take that, and then they take Paul's use of the word dispensations. And Paul, uh, the only time we find the word dispensations in the Bible, if I remember correctly, is, is two or three times, uh, and only spoken of by Paul. And uh, so they take this idea of dispensations, and this idea of rightly dividing, and they don't get it. They think that um, we rightly dividing means you divide periods of history up, uh, and uh, you uh, uh, ascribe to that period a different system of salvation. Uh, whereas rightly dividing, uh, it, you know, a, a modern translation might going to translate rightly handling. And I actually prefer that over dividing because the word dividing causes a, a lot of people 
a, a lot of confusion. They were misapplying this word divide, thinking that we divide it into different systems of salvation, where we're, we're really only dividing it into uh, periods of time where man knew more or, or knew less about uh, God's plan. Uh, so we've got, and, and the word dispensation is not a period of time where the plan is, is different. It, dispensation it just means like, if you dispense something, um, if I was dispensing uh, clothing and food to people to, to feed the, the hungry and clothe the, the naked, as we're, we're told to do, uh, if I'm dispensing that out, uh, that just dispensation means the act of dispensing. Um, it, it's not a period of time. And it's not a different plan. It just means God ha has actively been dispensing more knowledge about the plan of salvation. Uh, so this uh, uh, th this idea of the using, misunderstanding what dispensations are, uh, or dis dispensen dispen dispensing is, di misunderstanding what dispensing is, and misunderstanding what rightly dividing means has, has caused this uh, a big problem. And because of that, you have a lot of people thinking that uh, uh, instead of understanding the verses that they use to apply that, they, they say, well, don't worry about that. That's a different dispensation. But Matthew, no, it's a different dispensation. Only Paul is, is uh, teaching us about this dispensation. So stick only with Paul. And they say that you can't be saved by reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and especially bothers me because John is written specifically to teach us how to be saved. The book says. Uh, so, uh, okay, enough said on that. So, I want your further thoughts on that before we go further. Um, uh, dispensation just means to dispense, to, and I like the word you used to reveal. You know, a lot of times within that context of those verses, the mystery of God is mentioned, and that's what has happened over. Um, you know, the millennia is God has revealed himself uh, further and further to mankind. Uh, he's dispensed revelation to mankind. But the way to God has always been the same. Um, and so, yeah, you know, hyper dispensation of love, you know, rightly divide the word of truth and, you know, and use that to teach all this dispensational error. Um, which is nothing but confused, and like you said, it leads to disregarding parts of the Bible where every word of God is true, every word of God is pure. And so if you can't reconcile the word of God in a passage or a, a chapter or, or whatever, don't disregard it and say, well, it's another dispensation. That's the wrong way to rightly draw the word of God. Uh, you know, the right way is understand that scripture interprets scripture and everything is true and we must be hint of what it said in the Old Testament, the New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and going back to this verse, um, you know, where it says, you know, Romans 4, 6, you know, basically, basically it's quoting um, the song. And trying to see where that's quoted. Uh, Psalm 32, 2, where it says, Blessing is the man that says, He is the Lord of imputing God's iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Um, so, like you said, a thousand years before Jesus Christ manifest um, on this earth, you know, God manifests in the flesh. The plan of salvation has always been the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find it really. Ironic, and uh, I, if it wasn't such a serious thing, I'd say I find it hilarious that the people who are constantly flying this banner, rightly divide the word of God, rightly divide, they're the ones that are not rightly dividing it. They are they are over dividing it into all these different periods where and different plans, and and. Um, uh, really, uh, the only real division point in the Bible, uh, of course, we know that gradually more knowledge was, was dispensed by, to, uh, to us in the Bible, but the real only point in the Bible where it clearly says there is a, a distinct division uh, is the cross, 
where everything leading up to the cross was uh, looking forward to this deliverer, uh, this uh, savior. Uh, and then now after the cross, you and I, we're all looking back and say, it's finished. God kept his promise and provided salvation. Um, so isn't it funny that they're the ones that are always using the term rightly divide, the word of God, that they're, they're really over dividing it. Yeah. All right, so let's go to, uh, now it says a little more about this verse, this specific ter terminology here. It says, Un uh, blessed is the man, blessed means happy, happy is the man. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm sure you're very happy that you've received this righteousness from Jesus that was imputed to you. What does it mean, righteousness being imputed? And, and then, of course, it's imputed without any works. So tell me more about that word imputed. Yeah, you know, I look at it to, to impute means to assign, you know, to assign something to someone or to ascribe something. Um, and so, you know, the way I look at that word is we're imputed Christ's perfect righteousness. You know, so we're closed, are closed by his righteousness and not our own because our own righteousnesses are a filthy rag. So if we were to come to God with our works of righteousness, it would look like tattered rags in his eyes and his perfectness, his goodness, his holiness. So in order to be forgiven of sins, which it says in the next verse, you know, iniquities are forgiven and sins are covered. You know, just thinking about the other day, we were talking about, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, they realized once they were in iniquity, once they broke God's law, that they were naked and needed covering. They needed their sins covered. Uh, and I talked about, you know, Hebrews 4, 3. I think the Lord uh, in the Garden of Eden began to preach the gospel to mankind at that time and said, I'm, I'm the Savior. I'm the one that can give you my righteousness and cover your sins by faith in me. And, and so that's what we have to do. We have to realize that we're a sinner and need a Savior and then realize we can't use our own righteousness to receive the free gift to eternal life, but we need Christ's righteousness. And that's imputed or assigned to our account through faith. Yes. Um, there's a, another verse that talks about uh, this uh, righteousness being credited to us, or, or, or um, another version, I think, I don't know which, which version King James states it. It's either credited or counted as righteous. Uh, or uh, the word you use there, assigned, a righteousness was assigned to us. Or as Davis says here, we're covered. Or you, you, I, in other words, you could say, I got that covered for you. Don't worry about it. Or we could use the, the picture like you did with the, the covering of the, the animal skin with Adam and Eve. That's the first um, uh, foreshadowing in the Bible of the blood sacrifice. Uh, I have a playlist I put together uh, of um, a series I did called uh, uh, Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' uh, uh, blood atone, uh, sacrifice, uh, and and there's many. There's probably got like 20 of these examples that I go through in that teaching. But this is the very first one. It's a picture of look. Uh, uh, they Adam and Eve thought that uh, they they recognized they had done wrong and they they needed they, and something needed to be done to fix it. And their and their nakedness was symbolic of this. So they thought, well, we've got to cover our nakedness. So what they did was they went to work and they started sewing together fig leaves. And I think maybe the fig was the forbidden fruit, maybe. I don't know. But uh, they started sewing together fig leaves to cover up their bodies in this nakedness. Uh, and of course, God immediately taught us that, wait a second, you're trying to, you're, you're working at resolving this problem. First of all, you didn't trust me in the beginning to just keep eating from the, the knowledge of the, the, the tree of life, which is a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. Instead, uh, you decided to take matters in your own hand and try to uh, attain this knowledge of right and wrong 
That was your first mistake. And now you're trying to remedy it through your own works by covering your own nakedness. No, I'll handle it for you. Uh, but there's got to be death. There's got to be shed blood. So God, uh, to provide an animal skin, uh, it doesn't say that God killed an animal, but logically we have to conclude an animal was killed so to provide these skins to cover them. And that that's a picture of this covering that Jesus' righteousness covers us. Uh, so that's the, the imputed righteousness that we, we get from Jesus. Um, uh, there's a little bit more in this verse I want to go over, but let me see, get any more thoughts on that uh, imputed righteousness before we go on. think about it, <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing when we understand that um, all of our sins and, and every person, even if you try to pick out the best person in the world living today or living throughout history apart from Jesus, <clears throat> every, every, the, the Bible tells us that even the, righteous, the most righteous, their righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So <clears throat> the very best that man can do falls way short of perfection. And so uh, some of us have probably much more obvious sinful lives. Some of us, it's more secret and not as obvious. But if we were to be honest and have our list, our sins tallied up, the sins in our lifetime would probably amount to in the millions. Um, and, and, and But all those sins now were put on Jesus. He paid for them all. And then his perfect life, the only one that actually was able to live a sinless, perfect life. His righteousness is, is imputed to us. So we, our sins go on him. His righteousness goes on us. And uh, as it says here, he's, he's got us covered. Um, all right. Um, I guess we can go to the next verse. And any, any, unless you have a final thought on that. No, that's good. Okay. So the next verse is uh, Romans 10.3. Oh, I love Romans 10.3. This is one of my favorite verses. To you, there's, I'm going to get your thoughts on it first. Let me see. Control C. Uh, it takes me a second to take the number and put it onto the uh, Bible gateway here. Control V. Enter. Okay, so I've got it. And I've got it in the KJV because I'm a KJV firstist. Uh, but I've got it also in the Amplified because I think the Amplified states it in a way that uh, it really is uh, very helpful. So here's a, Romans 10.3 in the KJV. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Okay, brother, I, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. Here and always, all, I'm gonna always have you go first, so the pressure's on, pressure's on you. You said you love first, I was to defer to you. No, you got, I gotta keep you under, under pressure, and, and that way if you have a good idea, I'll just say amen. to come to God 
you know, repentance toward God, um, is have a whole heart and realize that that perfect standard, that testament, we can never keep. We can never do that. And that we need to find the person, our God, our Savior, who can and who did fulfill that. Um, and so, you know, there, it says here, maybe an ignorant of God's righteousness. I think what, how I look at that is they don't understand that that testifies to who God is. And that you can never live up to that. You can't become your own God by trying to live up to that law. Um, so don't go about establishing your own righteousness, but rather submit yourself to the righteousness of God. Understand that that's his righteousness that you need to receive. Um, you know, the schoolmaster to get us to Christ. Uh, so that's kind of how, you know, just initial opening thought uh, about that. You know, we see in... Um, you know, first century Judea, this happening, uh, we see it in the 21st century, the same as that thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, the reason I love this verse so much is that this, this really gives us a contrast uh, of what the world uh, thinks, uh, com- uh, contrasting what the Bible says. And, and it says, for they, now who are they? That's everybody apart from us who are saved. All the people who think instinctually, I, 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 for some reason, man instinctually thinks that in order to go to heaven, if, he, if God, if they think that, okay, someday I die and God will judge me. They, they think that um, they've got to have a level of righteousness that's to satisfy God. That, and so it says, for they, that means the whole world. That means all the religions of the world today, even most of of the people who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian. Let's call that Christendom. Uh, all the people in the world who say, I'm a Christian, even though uh, they're not a Christian the way the Bible defines it, most of them. Uh, so they are all the people who are really think that they've got to get to heaven through their own righteousness. Um, they're ignorant of God's righteousness. Well, God, God's righteousness is the only righteousness that's really true righteousness. And it's just like when I think we talked about the word good, um, and uh, the rich young ruler said to Jesus, good good master, uh, and Jesus, so why do you call me good? No one's good but God. Uh, and um, Jesus, of course, that's because man sees goodness and, and righteousness um, as a relative... Um, uh, in a relative way, there's degrees of goodness. There's a degrees of righteousness. But uh, Jesus tells us that, that no, uh, no one is good. No one is righteous. The Bible even says uh, no one is righteous. No, not one. The righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So how can that be? It's because the true righteousness, true goodness is perfect. It's absolutely Never having a bad thought, never a bad act, never failing to do good. Every and 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 no person, no man has been able to reach that level of, of that of perfection. And that's why the scripture says uh, we all fall short of the glory of God. Well, it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, the glory of God, I believe, is alluding to Jesus Christ and the life He lived. Uh, he set the standard, and the standard is perfection. And if you want to be judged on your own righteous, you better be equal to Jesus. And, and uh, if you can understand that you're not equal to Jesus, you fall short, and you're not righteous, you're not good, then maybe you can come to your senses and say, well, I need another solution to this problem because I cannot uh, satisfy God what God requires on my own. Uh, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're going about establish their own righteousness. Isn't that what every religion in the world is teaching? That you've got to, uh, you know, establish your own righteousness and be good enough so that when God judges you, He deems you acceptable. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, every religion except true Christianity teaches that you have to appease God in some way with your works of righteousness, and maybe you'll live up to being, you know, given eternal life if, if you live up to, you know, 
have you appease God by your actions. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, the Bible teaches exactly the opposite of that. Yeah, now you know that um, there's all these different factions in Christianity, even even the, the people that we would say, you're a true Christian, you agree, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and you're truly saved, I have no doubt about that, and yet they want to divide into these different factions about others, all these other things, and one of the things that they, people like to divide over is Bible translations. And I've said before, I, I was a strict, starch KJV onlist for 25 years, and now I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it first. But I'm not afraid to look at another translation, and I, I, and, and the one I like that I keep referring to is the Amplified, because it's kind of like what we're doing. We're amplifying the scriptures as we expound and discuss them. So the Amplified, I think, you'll agree, it is very, very helpful on this verse. Let me read this in the Amplified. For not knowing about God's righteousness, which is based on faith, and seeking to establish their own righteousness based on works, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Um, so let me ask you, do you, how would you interpret the this word submit? They did not submit to God's righteousness. In the KJV, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Uh, how, how do we depict that word submit? Submit, obey, another one that comes to mind is surrender. Uh, these are words that the Lordship Salvation is like, and they, as soon as they see these words, they immediately get excited and think that uh, they can use that uh, to prop up their heresy of uh, works, Lordship Salvation. Um, but again, when you understand what the um, true gospel is and the true means of salvation is not by works, uh, and then uh, we have to understand, well, what, how could we ex understand these words submit, uh, obey, and, and surrender? Well, I, I'd say that obey means, uh, let, o o obey what Jesus, um, uh, J John, Peter, Paul, they're all, all tell, told us that you need to tr trust Jesus for your salvation. Obey that as your, uh, and, uh, instead of rebelling and saying, no, no, it's not just faith in Jesus. I've got to do my part, uh, and Jesus is not enough. No, o obey what they said. 
and then, then submit. And it was another way of saying the same thing. Submit yourself to this doctrine of faith alone. Submit to that. And surrender, surrender I would say, is, hey, uh, I surrender. I'm giving up. I'm not going to try to work my way to heaven anymore. I surrender. I admit I cannot do it. I th just throw up my hands and defeat and follow my face and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And uh, Jesus, I'm going to have to depend on you. That's that's the surrender. Uh, right. And another way to use it, like in First John, you know, where it talks about you know, keep the commandments, you know. But what what's the commandment for eternal life? And you go to First John three twenty three, and this is His commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son Jesus Christ, you know, that and love one another. She gave us commandment. So you know the the commandment, the submission, the obedience is all point to faith in Jesus Christ. Receive essential life through faith, not any works that we do. Yeah. Okay, so uh let's go to uh, the next verse here. I know anything else you want to say before I move to the next verse? No, we can go with Romans five seventeen, is that what you got? Uh, is, oh, I put in 5, 7. It's 17, huh? Okay. All right. Okay. And then the next, number 5 is Romans 5, 18, so we may just do that together. It both talks about a gift and free gift, I think. Okay, let me, let me do, eight, put in 18 also. 18. Okay. Um, I'll, okay, I'll read them together then. Uh, Romans 5, 17 and 18. In KJV, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. All right, brother. There's a lot in there. There is. Um, this is one of my favorite passages. Yeah, I'm sorry that uh, Romans 5.12, which knocks the theory of evolution out of the park. You know, if you, if you truly trust the Bible and take it as true, uh, you know, and that leads into these few verses that we're going to talk about. The Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, is by one man's sin and entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death comes upon all men, but that all have sin. And then, you know, the rest of the passage shows this, um, you know, how by Adam, by man, you know, with Adam representing, representing the fall of man, you know, and, and sin gets brought into to the world by our transgression, by our rebelliousness, uh, and death by sin, then even so much more, you know, the free gift came about to uh, to give all eternal life. So by one, death came into the world, but by one man, you know, uh, grace, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the gift of righteousness is given to us. Um, and, you know, just, I guess that's... That's my initial thought from this. It's just, you know, it's a it's a comparison between uh, life and death, really, you know, and sin, which brought about death, and the forgiveness of sin, which brings about the eternal life. Um, we trust in ourselves. We're never going to, we're going to stay condemned, um, you know, in our, in our flesh. And in order to receive eternal life, we have to receive God's grace, mm -hmm. and that's through faith in Jesus Christ and not of works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't remember since I've got two Jacks here. I got Jack Smack and I got Jason Jack, and I'm, I'm with, with you. I'm talking about proof text for salvation for uh, uh, faith alone, and with Jack Smack, I'm talking about problem text for faith alone uh, that the Lordship's people want to use. And we we're explaining those. So I, I can't remember if I covered this with him or you, but I, I think it, it, these, some things are just worth repeating over and over again anyway. But when it says, I'm reading in the Amplified now, it says, 
uh, verse 17, for if by the trespass of one, and then in parentheses, it says Adam. So in there, we're, they, they plug in Adam, and you know, you mentioned Adam. So um, sometimes some person might read this and not even understand this is talking, going back to uh, the, uh, the, the first sin, the fall of man. So it says, for if by the trespass of one Adam, death reigned through one Adam. Let's stop there and, uh, and tell me a little bit more about exactly what that's referencing, this, this death in uh, and, and Adam. I think it would be good if, I'd love to hear your account of exactly what happened um, with Adam and Eve in the fall, and, and, and not only what caused it, but what, but what the result was of that event. So we know that uh, Adam and Eve, there was no issue between them and God. Uh, but uh, as, as the Bible describes this scene in the, in the garden, we see that they, uh, they first, they didn't believe what God said, and they instead they chose to believe what Satan said. And, and then they acted upon it and, and rebelled and, and ate from that tree. And then something happened. Um, uh, the fall of man. And at that moment, uh, we've discussed this, uh, I believe when we were talking about our um, atheism video, we went into this, but there, they died spiritually that day and, and they, there was a death sentence put on them and all their descendants. Uh, and so they, they became mortal. And, and that means that gradually our bodies die. Now, for me, for us today, it takes uh, 70 or 80 years. Back then, it took about 900 years, but um, uh, maybe the, the gene code uh, had not been um, uh, damaged as much, and gradually it got worse uh, um, uh, with humanity. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked about genetic entropy. I think, you know, there was something that happened with God's creation at the time of that first sin, that transgression that um, caused this gradual uh, entropy of death and mutation being introduced into his creation. Uh, 
they call you the our genome. That's why generation to generation we are passing down death, basically, you know, through uh, through the gene pool. Uh, with the uh, with the mutations that uh, increase each generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mutations are not a good thing, as as evolutionists would like us to believe. Mutations are always a bad thing, and, and uh, as as our uh, genetic code has uh, over throughout history become worse, the the disease condition we have of death has, has become uh, more exaggerated, so that we we die sooner. But the point is, uh, because of the fall, Adam and Eve were, uh, began to die physically. Their spirit died at that moment in, when, they, when they rebelled. And then uh, the, gene, the genes they passed down to us were, were uh, damaged. And we were basically, we, we've inherited a genetic defect in us, and which causes death. And uh, now... We also, now I don't know if you agree with this, uh, I've talked to people that, uh, uh, and it's not a salvific, salvific issue, but um, uh, I, I believe that man also uh, inherited uh, the propensity to sin. That, in other words, uh, uh, man has to sin because it's, it's his nature now. Uh, the, uh, the, Paul talks about uh, the, the nature of man the, being a, a sinful nature. And we have to have a be born again. We receive a, we become a new man. But there's a there's an argument, a, a, a conflict going on between the old man that has this sinful nature. It's natural for man to sin, uh, but the new man is sinless. So you have this conflict going going on for our whole lives. Um, so man. Uh, it, it is impossible for any person to go through that life and not and not sin, uh, because we've inherited the sin, sinful nature. Um, I don't know if, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that think, well, no, there's, we don't have a, we didn't inherit a sin nature. I don't, I don't understand how they can uh, um, think that it's, man doesn't have a sinful nature, that it's possible for, for us to well, actually. Yeah.
and you go on in, into eternal life. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's just a, a roundabout way of, of looking at it in medical terms, you know, being, <laughs> being a doctor and I'm taking a, uh, you know, virology course before. Well, I, I like the use of the word virus. I've, uh, I've talked about that in, in my preaching in the past about uh, um, if we consider that sin is, is, is a virus, then, uh, and we can think that uh, the, there's, a, there's a verse, I don't know where it is, I think it's in Revelation, but uh, there's no sin going to be in heaven. So sin is not allowed in heaven. So let's look at heaven as like a sin-free zone. It's like a, it's like a, when you have a, a, a virus or a plague going around and you isolate, uh, isolate it, and uh, you have a, what is that where you have an area where it's, uh, um, there's a word for that where you have a, a specific area that you set aside for that's going to be uncontaminated. Uh, but that's what heaven is. The, yeah, qu- quarantine. Okay, so, so sin has to be quarantined and kept out of heaven. Heaven is a sin-free zone. So uh, that's why people say, well, if you have any sin at all, not even one, you can't even bring one virus into this uh, this area that's uh, uh, free from the virus. You can't contaminate heaven with one sin. I mean, it's like someone said, if there's a sign above the gate to heaven that says uh, uh, no warps allowed and uh, you and I are at the gate and uh, I say to you, Jason, man, you got you got warps I, I, all over you. Uh, I can see hundreds of them. And I wonder how even how more how many more warps you have underneath your clothing. You're covered with warps and uh, it says no warts allowed. And you can't get in. And then you turn to me and say, well, but Luke, you've got one wart there on your face. I can see it. Uh, and, and it says no wart. So even that one wart, you can't go get in either. So, of course, the word is representing sin. It doesn't matter if we have a few sins or, or a lot of sins. It's zero tolerance. You can't let heaven be contaminated with any sin. So that's why man thinking that he can be relatively good is the wrong way to view this. You have to be perfect. Uh, you have to be sinless. And the only way to attain that is to receive this righteousness, as we talked about in the the last verse there, that it's imputed righteousness. Um, um, okay, I, I think I, I want to go over this verse again here uh, uh, um, before we finish a little bit more. But uh, any any thoughts on that? I'm taking your word virus and and uh, elaborating on that. Taking this uh, illustration of using the warts, uh, I think that that actually it would be very helpful to the whole world if our sins were displayed. Every sin that we've ever done, we got another wart, and it was visible. Then it would be undeniable. Uh, people would realize how sinful they are. Because even the, I don't meet anybody that says, well, I, I've never sinned. I mean, there are some people that think that they've... Uh, they're pretty darn good, 
but uh, no one's arguing that they're perfect and they never sinned. But if, if they actually got a wart for every sin and we saw the magnitude of it, it would, should, would really be humbling to it and recognize that how sinful man really is and, and our need for to get those warts removed. We need a wart remover. <laughs> That's the blood of Jesus. Um, okay, I'm going to read the verse one more time, get some final thoughts on it, then I think our hour is about up here. It says, um, in, in the Amplified, For if by the trespass of one, Adam, Death reigned through the one Adam, so we've, we've covered that pretty thoroughly, what that means. Much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, this is the point in this verse and the previous verse that this righteousness is uh, uh, received, uh, uh, God's righteousness, not our own. Um, so it says, uh, re we receive the abundance of grace and the free gift that's why I like to call it free gift theology rather than free grace. Uh, because it, free grace is, is a, is a true doctrine, but free gift is an actual word that we act, term that we actually see several times. And here we find it that, that this righteousness, this eternal life, salvation is a free gift. And almost everybody can relate to what a free gift is. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. You don't pay for it, you know, uh, someone gives you a gift, you're not obligated to pay them back, it's free, and, and the gift is salvation, and Jesus bought and paid for it with his blood sacrifice, and he offers us freely, uh, the free gift of righteousness, and reign in eternal life through the one, Jesus Christ, so then, as through one trespass Adam's sin, there is resulted condemnation for all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, uh, there resulted justification of life to all men. We didn't go over that that thoroughly, but we've, we've talked about it a little bit already about, okay, through one man, through Adam, we got sin and condemnation. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification. This one act of righteousness, what, what, how would you uh, uh, define that? What is that? in the Bible, Romans is the one where the theme uh, and uh, the, the whole purpose of that book is to, to explain this situation to us uh, so clearly uh, about man's uh, problem, uh, how we got the problem, and, and how the problem could be resolved uh, only through, uh, through faith in Jesus. Um, th there's a, a term, Romans Road, uh, a lot of people have used verses in Romans to uh, go present this uh, message that here's the problem and here's the solution. And it's very, very clearly spelled out step by step in Romans and very methodically by Paul. Uh, but I can't believe this. There are actually some Paul only us, even though Paul wrote Romans, they object to even using this Romans road as a, as a salvation message. They, they, they just, they're so stubborn about uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 being the gospel that they, they, they limit it. Even, even though Paul wrote Romans, they limit their, the gospel to that one thing. And I, I think the gospel is very clearly, thoroughly expressed of the, what the problem is and what the solution is. Isn't that the good news? Here's your problem and here's the solution. Just thinking about 
refer to this last, um, you know, this last verse, just um, in verse 18, you know, being the free gift came upon all men into justification of life. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are about, you know, the justification and all that. I mean, there's been whole books right now, just that word. Uh, but, you know, I look at it as declared righteous. And I think in the flesh, we're positionally declared righteous. But if God came down today while we were still living in our mortal bodies and judged us, we would not be justified. You know, we'd have too many warts on us, like you said. Uh, and and it, I go back to, like, uh, you know, beginning this discussion um, with um, back in Romans 4, where it talks about, you know, blessed is, blessed is the man. Um, speaking of David and quoting the Psalms, you know, Psalms 143 2, it says, And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. And so uh, that got me thinking, and, you know, then you talk about Hebrews 9 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after just the judgment. Uh, you know, I think we we have to die. You know, this flesh and blood has to die. Um, you know, in order to um, receive eternal life, we have to uh, die in the flesh because if, if God came down and, and judged this living mortal being that we have right now, um, you know, no man would be justified in his sight. So um, it's, the, it's the spiritual man, the immortal man that... Um, you know, and the, the Holy Spirit that fills that believer in Christ, that's who's being justified, you know. And that is the, that's who's declared righteous unto life, you know. That's that's who, um, um, that I think is what it's talking about there. Yeah. Someone sent me a, a whole bunch of messages yesterday uh, wanting to... Uh, uh, saying here why don't you make some videos about these things here and he he, he used a uh, reference a lot of uh, terms like justification uh, uh, redeemed and, and other things I don't remember everything on this he was quite lengthy uh, telling we need to really d d make a distinction between all these terms here um, I'm not sure I'm gonna do that but uh, and this while we're on the subject of Justification, and it's very popular to say justified means just as if I'd never sins, sinned. Um, uh, when we're justified because of our faith in Jesus and, and, and his uh, payment for our sins, uh, then God looks at us as just as if we had never sinned. That's justified. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a cute way of taking the word and, and applying it that, uh, correctly. So uh, that's how I see what justified is, just as if I'd never sinned in the sight of God. Right, yeah. Uh, all right, so I'd say that uh, our hour is up, hour and three minutes. So why don't we just take a moment here to make any like uh, final thoughts on the study today. Romans 4, 6, and 7, and, and, and that, that uh, portion, it, it says specifically righteousness without works. So we're, we're, the whole purpose of this uh, series we're doing is to emphasize the fact that we're saved by faith alone without any works on our part uh, required. Uh, so that's what verse 4 and 6, it clearly states that we get our righteousness without any works. And then in Romans 10, 3, it talks about how people are trying to establish their own righteousness, but that's not 
that's not going to satisfy God. What they need to do is uh, submit themselves to the righteousness of, of God, which say, ah, my righteousness is, is never going to be good enough. I need to uh, God to provide his righteousness, and he does that through faith in Jesus. Uh, and then Romans 5, 17 and 18, uh, that gives a little bit more about the, the history of the problem, uh, you know, uh, the fall of man uh, and, the, and the redemption of man. We fell from Adam's uh, uh, bad acts, and, and we, uh, we are, were saved because of Jesus' good acts. Uh, he lived a perfect life that we get credit for. He died for our sins on the cross. Um, and it says that uh, this uh, justification or salvation, this righteousness, is a free gift. And so all these things, clearly, a person should never be able to come away from this study thinking that uh, man uh, has to follow commandments, man must do religious works, man has to do anything to, uh, that, uh, to contribute to salvation. It's, it's entirely because of our faith in the person and finished work of Christ. Okay, I'll give you like any, any last thought and then we'll finish. Appreciate uh, you joining me and uh, carrying on these conversations, and I uh, look forward to the next time to the the view the, all the viewers. Uh, uh, I, I hope you don't stubbornly hold on to this uh, uh, false teaching that that uh, faith in Jesus is not enough. Uh, these any one of these verses should be sufficient to prove the point, but we've got a hundred and one of them. <laughs> and there's actually, there's actually several hundred we could list, but we're going to endeavor to discuss 101 of these uh, in this uh, series. All right, brother, thank you, and, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.